Praise the Lord. In the meantime, let's proclaim what we believe. Amen? Amen. I believe. This is the perfected word of God. I believe that in the volume of this book, it speaks about my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ. I desire not only to read it, to know it, through the power of God's Holy Spirit, to live it. Amen? Amen. Through the power of God's Holy Spirit, to live it. Turn with me, if you would, to Romans <laughs> chapter 9. And we are going to be looking at verses 10 through 18 this morning. And as we can recall, in the book of Genesis, and even more specifically, in the Garden of Eden, the Lord gave Adam and Eve a great freedom, didn't he? I mean, here, here's the Garden of Eden, God's garden. And the Lord told Adam, Adam, go for it. I mean, go for it. Let nothing stop you. But just one thing, Adam. Let me just give you this one directive. Just one. Adam, do not eat of the tree of knowledge. And you know what? The Lord didn't explain anything after that. He didn't explain this is the reason why you shouldn't, and if you do, this is going to happen or that's not going to happen. God didn't, didn't bother with any of that. God was demonstrating that, Adam, I'm God. And this is what I want you to do. So go for it. But what is it about us when we have the whole world in front of us? We have all kinds of pleasures and things forevermore in a godly fashion, but we're directed to something that the Lord told us not to do. What is that about the human race? I mean, Adam, go for it, but just don't fool around over here. In fact, just forget about it. And what does Adam do? I mean, Adam and Eve, they just go directly to that one thing that they're not supposed to do. I mean, there's a million other trees, right, in God's garden, right? A million, right? I mean, it's God's garden, so why wouldn't there be 10 million, right? But yet they're directed and they're guided to this one thing not to do, and they run to it. That's a fascinating thing. That's absolutely amazing. But God didn't explain the, the whys and the how comes. He doesn't have to. Likewise, today in our text, the Lord will be giving us this morning a lecture. A lecture. In other words, he's not going to say, let's talk about it or let's have a debate God's giving us a lecture this morning. A lecture is given when a teacher, a professor, whatever, and in this case, our teacher is God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit will be giving a lecture today. And when the professor was done with the lecture, he would close his notes and go out the back door. That was the end of it. The students were to receive what the professor was offering and giving. There was no back and forth, to and fro discussion, students' opinions, not important to the professor, not at all. A lecture is designed to give information. Therefore, our lecture will be giving us some information this morning, information that the Lord wants us to have. God wants to reveal another little slice of who he is to us. And he's done a great job through the scriptures we hold in our laps, right? He's done a marvelous job. Like in the garden, the following is information that might be hard to understand. Yet God wants us to have this information and he wants us to accept his directive, as we're going to see in Romans chapter 9, verses 10 through 18. So it's not a debate. It's not a conversation. The Lord is going to say and tell us what's going on here. It's up to us to receive it. So, Father, I just ask you once again, speak to us. Holy Spirit, I know you're here. Present what it is that you have for us and let us receive it as you see fit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Last time in the book of Romans, in the chapter, of Ro uh, chapter 9, 
we were left by the Lord saying, I will return about this time next year and Sarah will have a son. That was the promise, the promise that was given to Abraham and Sarah. And so, hey, Sarah is going to be pregnant. Nine months later, she's going to have a child. And we saw that child, Isaac's birth announcement in Genesis chapter 21. And as we left last time, the question was, as we left, are we children of the flesh or children of the promise? It's one and two. Either the child of the flesh or you're the child of the promise. And so as we've been meditating on that all week, I, I trust we've come to some conclusions and allowed the Lord to work with us accordingly. Now in verse 10, we are introduced to Rebecca. Rebecca, we find, is Isaac's wife. We understand that through the book of Genesis. But Paul is, is running through this. We're introduced to Rebecca in, in, in verse 10. And furthermore, in verse 10, we find Rebecca pregnant by her husband Isaac. Not only is Rebecca pregnant, but she is pregnant with twins. And so as we pick up at verse 11, Paul continues on and says in verse 11, for the children, speaking of the twins the, that were in Sarah's womb, the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, in other words, nothing to do with works, yet the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. And as it is written in Malachi chapter 1, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Wow, that's a pretty big lump just in one verse. I think we could all agree. Wow. Wow. Now, a Bible student once said to his professor that he was having trouble with this particular passage because he could not understand, the student could not understand why God hated Esau. And the wily old professor kind of stroked his chin and said, you know what, I'm having a problem with that passage likewise. But my problem is different than yours, Mr. Student, professor speaking. I do not understand why God loved Jacob. How come? It's God's will, election, that will stand. Not of works, but of him who calls. Jacob was a conniver. Jacob was a trickster. He was a man always looking out for himself. Now Esau, well, he was obviously a godless man as we go through the book of Genesis. Esau was a godless man filled with pride and self-dependence. When Esau saw something he liked, he took it. Jacob and Esau, we must admit, really aren't that much different, are they? They're not much different at all. So why would God choose Jacob over Esau? Now, not to do any more violence to the translation of Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. This is kind of a bad translation in the English language. A little more of a contextual point of view would be, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have loved less. And so it's, it's unfortunate that we have this word hated. I've, I've loved Jacob, but I love Esau less. So that's a little more of a, a little better concept for us. That probably eases our minds a little bit, but still we're not off the hook. Not by any means. In this passage, and it's simple. And there has been volumes and libraries and bookstores and internet feeds filled with every kind of idea you can imagine. But there's a simple reality here. God is simply demonstrating 
his sovereign will. That's it. God is simply demonstrating his sovereign will. Sovereignty. Supreme ruler. Sovereign. Ultimate power. God saying, I'm sovereign. My will will be done. Often, let's admit it, you and I are quick to pray, oh, Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. But then all of a sudden, when we face something we don't like, we say, hey, wait a minute, Lord, I'm not so hot on your will. <laughs> right? Or is it just me that does that? Are you engaged in that too? Okay. Lord, your will be done, but, you know, I'm hoping that's not your will. Ouch. Yeah. Ouch. Wow. So it's really, this is a come to Jesus meeting today, quite literally. And trust me, I have been wrestling with this for so long because I know all you Bible students out here are just waiting. I'm going to jump on this guy when, he, when I get the opportunity. It ain't going to happen. I was like Jacob all week when Jesus was holding me by the head and I'm swinging and flailing. He's, he's just saying, you're going to get tired here pretty quick. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. And I kept trying to tell the Lord what this scripture meant. And I mean, I've had pages of notes that I went, delete, delete, delete. Because I kept, the Lord kept bringing me back to the text and said, that's not what it says, Greg. What you're saying is all nice and flowery and, and uh, the yellow brick roadie and everything. It's not what the text is saying. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. No, I'm not kidding you. All the way up to this morning. I was in the office before anybody, I mean, you know, praise the Lord, but I'm like, Lord, help me out. I mean, I can't quite close this. I can't quite close it. And the Lord kept with me. Sovereign, supreme ruler, ultimate power, God's will. Nevertheless, let us be bold enough to admit we struggle with this passage before us. Let's admit that. Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. We are struggling with that. Let's just face it. Why do we struggle with this passage? Well, simply put, we are rebellious. That's it. Done. I could actually be finished right here. We're rebellious. That's why we're struggling with this passage. We are rebellious. We're saying, hey, that's not fair. While I was in boot camp in the military, we were getting kind of short. We were getting, you know, you kind of get goofy when you start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel in boot camp. I mean, who's with me here? You, you veterans, you guys? You get a little goofy when you start getting toward, you see the light at the end of the tunnel. So you start taking some freedoms, you know. You're thinking, wow, you know, because you've been locked down for weeks. And so you get a little freedom, but, you know, freedom becomes responsibility. And this little dude, and he was a, he was a big mouth. He was a hot shot. Good guy. Great, you know, God bless him. But he got a little cocky one day. He got a little smart alecky. And he heard next door, because we shared a wall in the barracks, and he heard something going on. And he goes up to the wall and says, hey, what are you guys doing over there? And the voice back says, Who's this? He says, I'm the drill instructor. He says, oh, really? Well, I want to come over and, and, and I'll report to you right away. And, and, such. And, and while he's still talking, the other guy on our side, the mouthy guy is still talking, the drill instructor ran around and came in, and he's still at the wall. Hey, yeah, I want, I'm going to put you on report, this, that, and the other thing. And here's the drill instructor saying, Really? And finally, I mean, this kid turns around, and I mean, he just turned all kind of different colors, purple, white, <laughs> yellow, the whole bit. My point of it is, his whole point was, hey, this is not fair, this is not right, but guess what? He got washed back to week two. Didn't matter what his opinion was. The supreme ruler said, you're going back, and man, that literally put the fear of God into the rest of us. We weren't acting goofy anymore after that, man. We were back. We found our military bearing once again. We found We kind of were playing with it before, but now we're like, whoa. And he got sent back to week two. Unbelievable. 
Hey, Jacob, I've loved, but Esau, I've hated. That's not fair. That's not right. Because we're rebellious. That's why we come up with these things. Rebellion is sin. Samuel tells us in his writing in 1 Samuel 15, 23, you're familiar with it. The sin of rebellion is as if you're engaged in witchcraft. Sometimes we get a little careless with our sin. Sometimes we're a little casual. So the question is, is why is this important for us to realize that God's sovereign? And he doesn't have to explain anything to us. Why is it important for us to realize this reality? Because many have fallen away from the Lord because they didn't want to accept his sovereign will. Many have fallen away. Many have. Because they were rebellious and they didn't want to accept God's sovereign will. Others resist the Lord and they remain in their rebellion. They remain in their sin. Many die in their sin. There's no hope after that. None. None. Thirdly, many are confused, and I need us to listen to this point. Thirdly, many are confused because the church at times puts a happy face on sin. That's on us. When we put a happy face on sin, that's on us. When we tell someone, oh, hey, that's fine. Just come on in and get the word. You know, Jesus loves you. And, you know, you were born that way, so don't worry about it. God understands. That's on us. We're putting a happy face sticker on sin. That's why people are confused. They continue in their lifestyle, and they just come back and say, gee, I'm empty. I don't know why. You keep telling me it's okay, but I am drained. But we're afraid to tell someone that they're in sin because they may never come back to the church. Oh, my. We're busy counting nickels and noses. And so, therefore, we say, well, you don't like that gospel? Well, let me give you a different one. Oh, you like that one? Okay. Okay. But then by the time you keep your list, man, you start running out of paper. Whose gospel, who likes what gospel? You start running out of, running out of note paper. And so people are confused, and they're dying in their sin. And that's on us. That's on us. So we struggle, as we struggle with this subject, we have to say, Lord, I don't quite understand this, but what I do understand, Lord, I'll stick with that, and you're sovereign. That's what I understand. That's what I'll stick with, Lord. You've got a plan, and I'm going to keep it simple, Lord. Your will be done. If this is what you're telling me and telling us through Scripture, then great. I'm all for it. I'm all for it. So as we struggle with this subject, God by no means is done with us yet. As Paul asks in verse 14, what shall we say then? So now that we realize that God said, hey, Jacob, I love, Esau, I hate, what do we do with this? Is there unrighteousness with God? Paul is asking, is that what we conclude? God's not fair. He's not right. He needs to be corrected. Hey, if you want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Lord, please don't invite me to that party. Do not, because I'm not coming. I am not coming. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? I mean, that's the conclusion we have to come to. If God's wrong, if it's not fair, that's not right, then, we, hey, God, you're wrong. Is God wrong? Certainly not, Paul says. We've seen this certainly not statement. We've had eight chapters of it. It's the final stamp when Paul says certainly not. That's it. We don't discuss it anymore. It goes no further. Is there unrighteousness in God? No. So therefore, if we think God's wrong, we know that we're wrong. If we disagree with God, we're wrong. That's as complicated as this gets. But yet it doesn't sell many books on tour. Maybe that's where the problem lies. Maybe that's the problem. This is just too simple.
but yet we're unwilling to recognize that. Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. Verse 15, for he says to Moses, God speaking to Moses, way back when, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy. God's sovereignty coming through, huh? I'll have mercy on who I see fit. And I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. God's saying, I'm the, the master. I'm it. Do you have a problem with that? <laughs> that's what the Lord is saying do you have a problem with that and yet Isaiah through Isaiah he says hey come you know we can reason together but right now I'm telling you this is the fact of the matter in this circumstance there, there's no discussion I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and compassion on whom I have compassion mercy not getting what we deserve does anybody here deserve salvation? Did anybody work for their salvation here? Anybody? Oh, good. I'm glad. I'm glad none of us worked for the mercy God gave to us, revealed to us salvation, the hope that we have in, for glory. I'm glad we didn't work for it. That is comforting. So God was saying, I'll give mercy. What's our response? I'll receive it. Sounds pretty smart to me. So then verse 16, it is not of him who wills nor of him who runs, but it is of God who shows mercy. Man, this is beginning to humble me. Man, Lord, I want your mercy. God is not obligated to show mankind mercy. He's not obligated to do so. God owes you and I nothing. Man, we're starting to be reminded of our place. As my buddy was yelling through the wall in the barracks, he forgot who his, what, where his place was. He thought he was the drill instructor. And he quickly was reminded he wasn't. This is what God is desiring to get our attention. God owes us nothing, but he's given us everything. Wow. That is a humbling thing for us to receive. Verse 17, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, Pharaoh, I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Has anybody come to the Lord because of your brand new testimony? Of course they have. Tons of people have come to the Lord because they saw what God did in your life. They saw it. It couldn't be denied. Oh, it was ignored for the first couple of weeks. It was shined on for the first several months. But after months turned into years and your walk was still steady, people started thinking there is something that has changed in that person. And I know that person. And they have changed. And then they say, man, what's going on in your life? Let me tell you what God has been doing. And they turned around and said, man, I want some of that. And they said, you said, great. And you took the right hand and you said, man, let's pray. And they came to Christ. Because of what God did in your life. What he did in your life. That was the testimony. Pharaoh, I'm going to use you to declare my sovereignty. And Pharaoh, you know, and, and he finishes up in verse 18, before I get too far ahead. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. Now, Pharaoh was a willing vessel to be used for evil. He had already proven that. Pharaoh put the kind of unbelievable burden on the Hebrew children... It was really, it was just a labor of death. That's what Pharaoh was good for. I am going to use these people, beat them into the ground, and then I'm going to bring in a replacement and bring that person and beat them into the ground. Pharaoh was a willing participant in the actions of evil. And yet God said, hey, I'm looking for someone to use. And really, subconsciously, Pharaoh was saying, oh, here am I, Lord. And God said, fine. Fine. 
since you want to engage in this, I will proceed with that and I'll even help you out. I'll harden you up every now and again too. But you've already done that, Pharaoh. You don't need much help from me. But I'll be glad to assist, no problem. What a tragedy. Additionally, the pharaohs of the day, much like the Caesars of the New Testament times, if you will, the pharaohs of the day were considered gods. They were considered gods. And yet, Jehovah had a different idea. The Lord God was saying, hey, if your pharaoh is God, well, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen, and your quote-unquote God is going to be able to be, hel- he's going to be helpless to stop what I'm going to introduce in the very near future. All that to, to let the, the Egyptian common people start to question, is Pharaoh really a god? While we're batting away these flies, as our animals are dying, as we're sitting in the dark, but yet the Hebrew children are enjoying the lights, is Pharaoh really a god? Right? That's what the Lord was saying. Come on, you know. Let's dance. Well, hey, come on. You want to dance with me? I'll dance. Is he really a God? And so this morning, I pray and I trust that God is reminding us what our place is. Our place is under the mighty sovereign hand of God the Father, Jesus God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. As we sang this morning, I believe. Can we explain away each and every solitary thing that goes on in life? Absolutely not. Because the ways of the Lord are not our ways. So we don't always understand it, but yet this morning, this is a very pertinent reality. He's God, we're not. That's easy to receive, isn't it? I sure think so. Previously, as we close, Paul has reminded us that all have sinned, all. King David reminds us of that in Psalm 51. I was born a sinner. Sin, as we know, leads to death. That is a fact. Nevertheless, in our reading today, God has exercised and demonstrated his sovereignty, and yet he still shows mercy. That's evidenced by this group here. God shows mercy. He forgives through the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's what we get to glory in today. We don't have to understand every single solitary thing, but by faith, we continue to walk. And that's what the Lord has shared with us today. Let me be God, you be my children, and you'll be blessed. Adam, you got the whole playground. Forget about this thing over here. Go play. Calvary Chapel, Harupa Valley, go play. Enjoy the Lord. Love him. Let him draw you close to you. Have conversation with him, but also submit to the fact, Lord, I don't need to know everything. But what I do know, Lord, is that you love me and you called me. And now I ask you to commission me, as you have, to share the love that you've imparted to me to those that don't have you. Let's settle it today. And let the results be up to the Lord. Amen? Amen. If I could ask the worship team to come join me. Forgiveness of sin through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Is there anybody here this morning that doesn't have Jesus, that needs a relationship with Jesus? Simply identify yourself. Just put your hand up. I need Jesus today. We want to pray for you. Anybody? Great. We want to take this moment, too, to address our Internet viewers. We are grateful to have you. We are blessed. And we want to encourage that as these teachings have gone out, and they've gone out for months and years now, and for the body of Christ here at Harupa Valley, we're gaining, getting some traction. We're getting some good participation on the Internet. But yet, we want to invite our Internet folks 
that if you need a relationship with Jesus Christ, simply humble your heart unto Jesus, ask him to come into your heart and receive him and qualify that in this book of Romans, in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Cry out to the Lord this morning, this evening, and ask him into your heart, and he will indwell you unto salvation. If you've done that over the internet, we'd like to invite you to send us an email, and wherever you are, because we know that this broadcast is being picked up throughout the United States, we want to help you find a Bible-teaching, Bible-believing church, get you plugged in. So praise the Lord. So we thank you so much, Calvary Chapel, for supporting the media ministry. If you're looking to help, uh, like to help in something, we need help in the media ministry. We'd love to put you to work in the social media ministry. Have you got that skill? Come on, this is a great time for a commercial. So if, if you have an ability, uh, the, the media folks will be glad to get you plugged in. We'd be glad to have you. In the meantime, if you need prayer, come on up front. If you need coffee, we'll meet you in the Bean Redeemed. And we're having our grief ministry, just as a quick reminder, our grief ministry uh, right after the service. So we'd love to, love to meet with you. God is good? All the time, God is good. Praise the Lord. Join us by standing. It's because of your love, Lord, we celebrate in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go out praising the Lord.